Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Madhu Kaza. Uh, born in Andhra Pradesh, India, Madhu H. Kaza is a writer, translator, artist, and educator based in New York City. She is the co-editor of a recent anthology, What We Love, and the editor of Kitchen Table Translation, a volume that explores the connection between slant translation and migration and which features immigrant, diasporic, and POC translators. She directs the Bard Micro College at Micro Brooklyn Public Library and teaches in the MFA program at Columbia University. Please welcome Madhu Kaza. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to first introduce um, Azarine and then uh, Wakey. Um, really excited to be here with them tonight. So um, to begin, um, Azarine van der Vliet Ulumi makes you want to use all the names. I mean something more than her obviously wonderful Dutch Iranian name. I was reminded while reading her of the novel Boxeo Sobre Hielo, or Boxing on Ice, by the Barcelona-born Spanish writer Mario Cuenca Sandoval, which begins in this way. Me llamo, my name is, Miquel Laresti Gris, Vigeland, Barth, Melville, Gauguin, Chopin, Shakespeare, Humboldt, Velasquez, Sexton, Hemingway, Valerie, Zola, Conrad, Lorca, Bowie, Foucault, Camus, Voltaire, Nietzsche, Hugo, Rivoli, Poe. It actually goes on. Uh, <laughs> anyway. The narrator of Call Me Zebra, called Zebra, but born Bibi Abbas Abbas Hosseini, the daughter of Abbas Abbas Hosseini, granddaughter of Dalir Abbas Hosseini, uh, great, granddaughter, great granddaughter of Arman Abbas Hosseini, and great great granddaughter of Shams Abbas Hosseini, not only carries a tremendous awareness of her family birthright, but might also easily be, be found to say in Catalan, Mdik, or my name is Zebra, Bibi, Hanum, Abbas, Abbas, Nietzsche, Kafka, Clarice, Rilke, Cervantes, Borges, Kim Manzo, Pla, Dante, Said, Dali, Shakespeare, Gaudi, Camus, Acker, Benjamin. These are just some of the people who live inside the narrator of Call Me Zebra, a self who is always many selves. I'm in awe of the way Ulumi draws on this plurality of voices to create a narrator who, displaced from her homeland by the nightmare of history, reeling from the loss of both her mother and father, and with no place to call home, constructs a relational self through what she calls a matrix of literature. Literature is one type of home here, and so, possibly, is love, though far more dangerous and difficult to achieve for their narrator who knows so much of calamity and loss. At one point, Zebra asks, how am I supposed to reconcile being an exile with loving someone? Where is my mother, my father? Where's the archive of my nation? What nation? Which one? Which one could I claim to call my own? This funny, sharp, confident, unabashedly intellectual novel is also a tender story about loss, historical and personal, and the possibility of many types of love, of literatures, of literature, of nations, of cities, and of another person. In addition to Call Me Zebra, Azarine van der Vliet Ulumi is the author of the novel Frack Healer and assistant professor in the MFA program in creative writing at the University of Notre Dame. She is the winner of a 2015 Whiting Writers Award and a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree, and the recipient of a Ful Fulbright Fellowship as well as a residency from McDowell and Lettig House. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review, Guernica, Granta, Baum, and elsewhere. She has lived in New York, Los Angeles, Tehran, Dubai, Valencia, Barcelona, and currently splits her time between South Bend, Indiana, and Florence, Italy. Please welcome Azarine van der Vliet Ulumi. Thank you for that beautiful introduction and for hosting us here tonight. It's really a pleasure to be here. And there was something really moving in just hearing those names read out loud, so thank you for that. I'm going to jump around just a little bit. Um, I'll read the first page of the book and then read the beginning of the New York section since we're here. 
And then I'll skip forward quite a bit to um, a section in Girona. Illiterates, abecedarians, elitists, rodents all, I will tell you this. I, Zebra, born Bibi Abbas Abbas Hosseini, on a scorching August day in 1982, am a descendant of a long line of self-taught men who repeatedly abandoned their capital, Tehran, where blood has been washed with blood for a hundred years to take refuge in Noshar in the languid, damp regions of Mazandaran. There, hemmed in by the rugged green slopes of the Elbors Mountains and surrounded by ample fields of rice, cotton, and tea, my forebears pursued the life of the mind. There, too, I was born and lived the early part of my life. My father, multilingual translator of great and small works of literature, man with a thick mustache fashioned after Nietzsche's, was in charge of my education. He taught me Spanish, Italian, Catalan, Hebrew, Arabic, English, Farsi, French, German. I was taught to know the languages of the oppressed and the oppressors because according to my father and to my father's father and to his father before that, the wheels of history are always turning and there is no knowing who will be run over next. I picked up languages the way some people pick up viruses. I was armed with literature. After leaving Van, my father, Abbas Abbas Hosseini, and I spent years moving across the surface of the earth in search of a place to think. We were like the slugs that come out after a hard rain, ugly, weather-beaten, dispossessed, the refuse of the world. So it goes. No matter how many times you try to replant an uprooted tree, it seems always to fail to take to the soil. The exile never outruns history. Such are the consequences of being born unlucky in an inhospitable world. There's a line by Baudelaire that sums it up rather well. Il me semble que je serai toujours bien là où je ne suis pas. I encountered that same line written in the words of Paul Auster after we'd settled in the wretched new world. It seems to me that I will always be happy in the place I am not. It seemed just as prophetic then. By the time we did reach the so-called new world, many years had passed since my mother's death, since our harrowing fugue from Iran, an egress that had chilled our bones and left our hands permanently cold. From that point on, I had maintained the temperature of a corpse. Under the specter of grief, we moved through Turkey, and after a series of digressions designed to renew or falsify this or that paper, we arrived in Barcelona, our destination, the city of bombs. There, my father hoped to meet other autodidacts, anarchists, atheists. But events never unfold the way one imagines they will. Barcelona, cautious and worn down by years of oppression it was subjected to by the childish whims of General Franco, ultimately disappointed him, and soon we were on the road again. At times, during our long journey, we seemed to make progress in leaps and bounds. We would move across huge chunks of this uneven universe at the speed of light, then suddenly, Breathless and exhausted, we'd be unable to proceed and would move backward again. The path we would, had taken would fold over itself, looping, looping backward as if it were leading us toward some information we had been too impatient to discover the first time. We would scurry back in a panic, only to discover that there was nothing there. This sense that we had forgotten something had turned both of us into entirely unintelligible beings. I don't know how long we stayed in each place. I drifted in and out of the light. I was often lost to myself, and even when I wasn't, I had no idea how it was that we had come to be wherever it was we were. I still don't know. All I know is that when we finally arrived in Barcelona, I was two years older than when we had first left Iran. Three years later, we were in New York City, hopeless, disoriented, famished. More than a decade had gone by, somehow. Now, 22, I still burn with rage, grief, and confusion at the arduous path of my past. I stood with my back to the cloisters and looked out over the Hudson. The Couchard, the Bonfort, the saint Guillaume, and the Tree were behind me, all having been clinically sliced from the medieval French abbeys and rearranged here into an artificial hole. The Hudson was below me, 
green, serpentine, slithering lazily by. I sat down on a bench to take in the commanding view. The fog climbed up the sides of Fort Tryon Park, suspended over the water, caught in the gauzy winter light. The George Washington Bridge looked like a giant mosquito net. It was a dreary, damp day. My father was in our Inwood apartment, lying supine on his mattress, approaching death. Soon I would have to bury him just as I had buried my mother. I would have to lower his body into the ground. I would have no one left to love. Sitting on that bench, watching the fog rise over the river, I thought to myself, years have passed since we left Iran. I sat there and yearned for the most banal things. Figs, pomegranate trees, date palms. Then I thought, enough. There's no point in pining over a country with a thousand heads, a country that is always changing, that had become unrecognizable to us. I got off the bench and walked up to the railing that runs along the perimeter of the park. I leaned over the edge. I could hear the river down below. Swoosh, swoosh, swoosh. The moving water made the same sound the sentences written by my ingenious forebears made as they swirled around the infinite abyss of my mind. I could no longer see out. The fog was covering everything. Instead, I looked inside myself. I saw acres of consciousness decimated by the lacunae of exile. I felt indignant, downtrodden, lost. I considered leaping into the river. I didn't want to survive my father's death. Then I thought, no. I am truculent, combative, as good as any other human at kicking around the dust piled up on this miserable earth. And if I were to kill myself off, why should I do it here? I looked around. I said, never. If I'm going to die, I thought, let it be among estranged brethren. As forlorn as I was, I would never leap off the edge of this new world, this land of thieves, with my back to a conglomeration of fake cloisters that have been dismantled from real French abbeys and reassembled here. As if the old world were a mausoleum. What a laughable lack of perspective. There goes my gallery card. <clears throat> so I'm skipping ahead, and the only thing you really need to know is that um, Zebra is in an obsessive love affair with uh, this philologist, Italian expat, named Ludo Bembo. And she's also stolen the cockatoo pet from uh, Kimonzo, a literary critic that she was renting a place from in Barcelona. And she's stolen him only because she really believes her mother's spirit has reincarnated inside of the bird. So she has good reasons. <laughs> By the time I arrived at Ludo's doorstep, my ears were hot with fear and rage. As I knocked on his door, I thought to myself, what if he refuses my company? What if he invites me in? My thoughts spun and stretched. I knocked again, but no one came to the door. I was temporarily thwarted. I was forced to spend the night on a bench in the mud outside Ludo Bembo's apartment. The bench was affixed to a dirt-covered overlook planted with a few young plane trees. It offered an astounding view of the foothills. The Pyrenees possessed an unnatural gleam. The range's black form, composed of deep grooves and ridges and moss-encrusted rocks, was shrouded in a fine layer of mist, vapor that appeared to have been backlit. I sat there with Taut and stared into the distance until the curtains of night were drawn. The sky turned purple before it turned black. What is the nature of my predicament? I asked the bird. I am from nowhere, homeless, adrift, bewildered, crippled with endless estrangement. Taut nodded along in agreement with the calm patience of a man who has been locked up his whole life. He was weary from traveling, and his exhaustion had transformed him into a polite and cooperative being. What does that make me, I asked. He shrugged his wings as if to say, how should I know? Just then, I heard a breathless voice yell, like the clear-eyed Edward Said, you are a specular border intellectual. It was my father's muffled voice coming from deep inside my void. I barely recognized him. I swooned over Saeed's name. It warmed my inky blood. It was true. As usual, my father's assessments were spot on. 
Though mutilated by my perpetual exile, I, zebra, was at home in my homelessness. I refused to blend the unreconciled veins of nationhood running through my body. I refused to produce a singular whole self, free of gaps and fissures, a being that poses less of a problem to the rest of the world. Instead, I, dame of the void, will continue to inhabit a liminal space between worlds, a position that affords me a vantage point from which to envision new formations of thoughts, to live beyond the frontiers of ordinary experience. I was soon on my legs, standing before Ludo Bambo's home. The door had a hand-shaped metal knocker. I stared at that sick hand. It had a prophetic aura about it. It was moss green and freckled with rust, as if blood had been sprayed across it. I looked down at my hands. My fingers were hurting again, the way they'd hurt when Ludo and I had had sex, and the way they had hurt when I'd nudged my father out of his stupor upon my mother's death. I felt nauseous and retreated to the bench. I watched the violet fog roll over the mountainous frontier. The day's rain had kicked up the faint smell of my father's death. I leaned back into the bench and put my legs over the miniature museum. I comforted myself with the thought that soon Ludo Bembo would have to return home. Soon, I thought, I will have to introduce myself to his friends. I found a muddied piece of old string in the dirt and tied Tao to the bench. He had begun to strain my shoulder. I walked over to the young plane trees which had barely taken root in their terracotta planters and introduced myself to them as if they were his roommates, Agatha, Fernando, Bernadette. Hello, I said to the first tree, shaking a handful of its thin and supple branches. I am a non-Western encroaching on the territories of the West. I stepped back to reflect. The phrase fell short of what I'd wanted to say. It was an approximate unit of thought, incomplete, reductive, uncomplicated. It didn't account for the fact that the West had aggressed upon me while I was still in the East, and that this invasion, the cultural assassination imposed upon me by the West, had forced an agonizing and psychologically maimed version of me to cross over into the West and contaminate its territories with the very distortions it had caused but now refused to acknowledge, that on top of everything else, the West was gaslighting me. That's right. I had been gaslighted by the imperial powers of the world, but much like the New World, this tree was too young to understand. It said nothing in return. I gave it a little kick and moved on. Taut, whose fate was no better than a hostage's, expressed his delight by hopping up and down on the rim of the bench as far as the string permitted. Hello, I said, petting the soft foliage of the second tree. I, zebra, am recrossing borders I've already crossed in order to map the literature of the void and prove once and for all that any thought worth preserving in our pitiable human record was manifested in the mind of an exile, an immigrant, a refugee. The tree bowed. At the center of the archive of Western thought, I continued, encouraged by the tree's grace, is the pain of those who have suffered at the hands of the xenophobic and militant fascists of the West and their puppets in the East. I looked at the tree. It was sulking empathically. The tips of its branches were pointing despairingly at the ground. Spain, of course, is no different, I informed the doting tree. Spain is the original culprit. It is singularly responsible for the establishment of the so-called New World, for the invention of the West. The Spanish of yore were expert annihilators, all of them. Just then, the moon emerged, and with it, a soft Sephardic tune of loss and longing rose from the Museum of Jewish History, directly downhill of us. The church bells at the cathedral chimed in. Why would the Catalans, who so wish to distance themselves from Spain, want to claim Christopher Columbus as one of their own? Why would they have erected a statue in his honor at the port of Barcelona? The ego, I said, resuming my lecture. The ego. It renders all of us incoherent. The tree bowed again. I had never encountered a more deferential tree, a tree with more moral integrity. It was dignified, wise beyond its age destined to take its place in the highest ranks of the intelligentsia. I decided not to bother with the third tree. For once, I thought, why not end the night on a good note? I spotted a rock in the moonlight. I picked it up. It made for a great pillow. I lay down on the bench. Taut settled between my legs. We slept badly, but we slept. Thank you.
Um, the narrator of chemistry says, all comedies end in marriage, all tragedies end in death, but what about everything in between? In Wakey Wang's novel, uh, chem Wakey Wang's novel, Chemistry, shows us that life, especially for a young woman, the daughter of Chinese immigrants pursuing a graduate, um, P a PhD in science, uh, life might be much more complicated. A marriage isn't necessarily a happy ending, and what feels like death, a breakdown, the failure to complete a PhD, might open up family wounds as well as the possibilities of self-discovery and real connection. Chemistry opens with a marriage proposal deflected and a career not quite taking off. The Chinese-American writer narrator keeps distance from everything in her life, her boyfriend, her career, her family. She suffers a breakdown over her failure to live up to her parents' expectations of her and pushes her boyfriend away over fears of being unable to love given the difficulties of her own parents' relationship. And yet, as she is sidetracked from the straightforward path of career and love, she begins to discover what it might mean to embrace multiple forms of love, filial duty, family love, romantic love, the love of a friend, the love of a pet, the love of one's work, the love of science and learning, the love of self. Despite the narrator's ambivalence and self-doubt, her inability to commit to marriage or science, her fear of disappointing her exacting parents, chemistry is also a book of delights. It's a funny novel that revels in language, the words and idioms that don't quite translate between cultures, a novel that delights in the world. Wakey Wang deftly interweaves facts and tidbits about the structure of atoms, the anatomy of spiders, the chemistry of clouds into the narrative. At one point, the narrator tells her boyfriend, but I am the only child of immigrants. What difference does that make, he asks. It's like deep space traveling, the narrator responds. This response evokes the narrator's feeling of isolation, her feeling of distance from the Chinese language and her Chinese relatives, as well as her fear that she will one day be left alone. But chemistry is also a joy to read. And in Wakey Wang's hands, this journeying, this deep space traveling, as we learn about light and color and the property of metals, also feels rather cosmic. Wakey Wang is a graduate of Harvard University, where she earned her undergraduate degree in chemistry and her doctorate in public health. She received her MFA from Boston University. Her fiction has been published in, or is forthcoming from, Atlanta, sorry, Alaska Quarterly Review, Glimmer Train, Plowshares, Redivider, and Smoke Long Quarterly. She's a 2017 5 Under 35 honoree of the National Book Foundation. Please welcome Wakey Wang. Hi, my name is Waiki. Thank you for that great introduction um, and for the direct quotes. Now I feel like I don't need to read. <laughs> but I will start from the beginning, um, so no context needed. The boy asks the girl a question. It is a question of marriage. Ask me again tomorrow, she says, and he says, that's not how this works. Diamond is no longer the hardest mineral known to man. New Scientist reports that Lancelite is. Lancelite is 58% harder than diamond and forms when meteorites smash themselves into Earth. The lab mate says to make a list of pros and cons. Write it all down, prove it to yourself. She then nods sympathetically and pats me on the arm. The, nabmate, the lab mate is a solver of hard problems. Her desk is next to mine and is neater but more result producing. Big deal, she says, of her many, many publications, and doesn't take herself too seriously. Is busy, but not that busy. Talks about things other than chemistry. I find her outlook refreshing, yet strange. If I were that accomplished, I would casually bring up my published papers in conversation. Have you read so-and-so? Because it is quite worth your time. The tables alone are beautiful and well-formatted. I have only one table out, or one paper out. The tables are in fact very beautiful, all clear and double-spaced line borders, all succinct and informative titles. Somewhere I read that the average number of readers for a scientific paper is 0 0.6. <laughs> so I make a list, 
The pros are extensive. Eric cooks dinner. Eric cooks great dinners. Eric hands me the toothbrush with toothpaste on it and sometimes even sticks it in my mouth. <laughs> Eric takes out the trash, the recycling, waters all our plants because I can't seem to remember that they're living things. These leaves feel crunchy, he said, after the week that he was gone. He goes that week to California for a conference with other young and established chemists. Also, Eric drives me to lab when it's too rainy to bike. Boston sees a great deal of rain. Sometimes the rain comes down horizontal and hits the face. Also, Eric walks the dog. We have a dog. Eric got him for me. I realize that I don't have any cons. I knew this going in. It is a half list, I tell the lab mate the next day, and she offers to buy me a cookie. In lab, there are two boxes filled with argon. It is where I do highly sensitive chemistry, the kind that can never see air. Once air is let in, the chemicals catch fire. It is, our, it's, it is also where I wish to put my head on days of nothing going right. On those days, I add the wrong amount of catalyst, or I add the wrong catalyst. Catalysts make reactions go faster. They lower activation energy, which is the indecision each reaction faces before committing to its path. What use does this work in the long run, I ask myself, in the room when I'm alone? The solvent room, officially, but I have renamed it the Fortress of Solitude. Eric is no longer in this lab. He graduated last year and is now in another lab. A chemistry PhD takes at least five years to complete. We met when I was in my first and he was in his second. Now I walk around our apartment and trip over his stuff. Big black drum bags and steel pots and carboys of brown liquid fermenting inside. Eric plays the drums and brewed beer. One con is how much space these two hobbies take up. But this is outweighed by the drums that I like to hear and the beer that I like to drink. My pro list grows at an exponential rate. We had talked about marriage before. Can you see yourself settling down, having kids? Can you see yourself starting a family? I didn't say no, but I didn't say yes. We had these talks casually. Each time he thought, if actually proposed to, I would say something different. At least now all my cards are on the table, he says, but please don't take too long to decide. It's been the summer of unbearable heat. At the Home Depot, we go up and down aisles looking for a fan. Our last fan broke yesterday, and next week it is supposed to be a hurricane, and next week it's supposed to be hotter. When Eric sees the hurricane report, he wonders if the people who wrote it are just screwing with us. Why would they do that, I ask. Because it's funny? Oh, right. Then a minute later, I laugh. Patience is Eric's greatest virtue. He will wait in longer lines than I will and think nothing of it. He will smile while holding a heavy fan at the old, as the older woman in front of him who has bought a huge stack of lampshades and at the moment of payment is having second thoughts. <laughs> she asks the clerk for his opinion. She asks Eric, do I need the magenta? Me, she doesn't bother with because I'm the one with the furiously tapping foot. The woman considers some more, turning each lampshade in her hands, but in the end purchases nothing. I tell Eric in the car that if I were to reimagine hell, it would be no different from the line we were just in, except the woman would never decide on a lampshade and the line would never move. Can you imagine, I say, a worse punishment than pushing that thing up the hill? A boulder, Eric says. I realize what a hypocrite I'm being to make him wait for an answer and then dwell on a 25-minute line. Once home, Eric sets up the fan and the dog goes crazy. Two years ago, Eric and I moved in together. We do not have a dog, but we were thinking about it. What kind, Eric asks, big, small? I don't have a preference. How about just adorable? When he first brings him home, I hear the tail long and bushy thumping against the couch. A 45-pound golden doodle, incredibly adorable. When he runs, his ears flop. If we never groomed him, his hair would keep growing, and he would look like a blonde bear. The blonde bear loves people, and this is good, but then we discover that he is afraid of everything else, the hair dryer, an empty box, the fan. Bad tempers run in my family. It is the dominant allele, like black hair. Eric has red hair. Our friends have asked if there is any way our babies will turn out to be gingers. Gingers are dying out, and our friends are concerned about Eric's beautiful locks. I say, unless Mendel was completely wrong about genetics, our babies will have my hair but our friends can still dream, an Asian baby with red hair. One friend says you could write a science paper on that and then apply for academic jobs and then get tenure. <laughs> Eric is already looking for academic jobs. He wants to teach at a college that primarily serves undergrads. 
because they are the future, he says, eager to learn, energetic, and happy, more or less, as com compared with grad students. With undergrads, I can make a real difference. I don't think... I don't say this, but I think it. You are the only person I know who talks like that, so enthusiastically and benefit of the doubt giving. But the colleges he's interested in are not in Boston. They're in places like Oberlin, Ohio. I'm certain that Eric will get the job. His career path is very straight, like that of an arrow to its target. If I were to draw my path out, it would look like a gas particle flying around in space. The lab mate often echoes the wisdom of many chemists before her. You must love chemistry even when it's not working. You must love chemistry unconditionally. The friends who ask about the red-haired babies are the ones recently married or the ones recently married with a dog. Whenever we have them over for dinner, like tonight, they think we are trying to tell them that we are engaged. News, they say? Not yet, I reply, but here, have some freshly grated Parmesan cheese instead. Behind my back, I know they are less kind. They ask each other, it's been four years, haven't it? They joke, she is only with him for his money. It is common knowledge now that grad students make close to nothing and that there are more PhD scientists in this country than there are jobs for them. When Eric first decides to do a PhD, it is in high school. He takes a chemistry class and it sells. This is in Western Maryland in a town with many steeple churches but no Starbucks. Every other year, we drive three hours from the D.C. airport through a gap in the Appalachian Mountains and arrive at a picturesque place where Eric seems to know everyone. He waves to the man across the shoe, horseshoe bar, his former band teacher. He waves to the woman at the post office, the mother of a high school friend. The diner with the horseshoe bar is called Niners. There is always farm land for sale and working mills. Sometimes I wonder why he left a place where every ice cream shop is called a creamery to work 70 hours in lab. He credits the chemistry teacher who asked him often, what are you going to do afterwards and don't just stay, stick around. A belief among Chinese mothers is that children pick their own traits in the womb. The smart ones work diligently to pick the better traits. The dumb ones get easily flustered and fall asleep. For their laziness, they are then dealt the worst traits, or perhaps this is just a belief of my own mother. Had you chosen better, you would have not ended up with your father's terrible temper or my poor vision. I don't want to believe this, but it has become so ingrained compared with mine, Eric's temper is non-existent. Thursday, trash day, we pick the wrong streets to go down and drive for miles behind a garbage truck. It is a one-way road. It is also a one-lane road, but not once does he sigh or complain. He puts on jazz music instead. Listen to this, he says. And all I hear is the going and stopping of trucks, the picking up and dumping of trash, the clinking of metal bins. So frustrated am I after one song that I lean over and press the horn for him. Then out the window, I shout at the truck, excuse me, do you mind? The PhD advisor visits my desk, sits down, and brings his hands together and asks, where do you see your project going in five years? Five years, I say in disbelief. I would hope to have graduated by then and be in the real world with a job. I see, he says, perhaps then it is time to start a new project, one is more within your capabilities. He leaves me to it. The desire to throw something at his head never goes away. Depending on what he says, it is either the computer or the desk. I sketch out possible projects, alchemy for one. If I could achieve, achieve that today, I would graduate tomorrow. A guy in lab strongly believes that women do not belong in science. He said that women lack the balls to actually do science, which isn't wrong. We do lack balls. But if he had said that to me at the start of grad school, I would have punched him. Coming in, I think myself the best at chemistry. In high school, I won a national award for it. I say cockily at orientation. Yes, that was me, only to realize that everyone else had won it as well at some point, in addition to awards I have never won. The lab guy is still around. He works with the lab mate. If all goes well, they will have another paper next year, and then they will graduate. Women lack the balls to do science, he still says, with the exception of your lab mate. She has three. Later, I ask Eric, how many balls do you think I have? It is poor timing. We have just gotten into bed and started to kiss. Um, none, he says, and the kissing is over. I was hoping he would have said something along the lines of three and a half. Thank you.
Um, thank you uh, to both of you. Um, it's so wonderful, first of all, I think, um, to have these love stories that feel very um, rich in the different forms of love. Um, both, both of the uh, novels have, um, there is romantic love within the stories, but they're kind of much wider also. Um, I wanted to actually begin um, with um, thinking about these characters as individuals, um, because I think that what's interesting is that there are also, there, these stories are love stories, uh, to some extent there's romantic love, but there are also stories of families, of histories, of, of migration, um, of literature and of science. Um, and the narrator of chemistry um, finds that she might not want to follow the path that, that her parents kind of have set up for her in terms of finishing her PhD and being the best at it, or she might not be able to um, be the best at everything she does. Um, so she doesn't necessarily want to follow, she doesn't want to be a sheep as the narrator describes. Um, but at the same time, she also discovers that she's not quite about being, um, she's not interested in American individualism per se either. Um, and in Zebra, th this, uh, Zebra is an incredibly, like fiercely independent um, person that you're, you don't want to mess with. And yet, at the same time, um, she's not quite, f she's not free either. I mean, she's so tied to this Hosseini intellectual tradition and um, she's negotiating like her role as the, la the last person in this line of um, intellectuals and uh, thinkers. So I'm curious if um, both of you might just speak a little bit about the relationship between this like very, um, this, the individual and like the, maybe the burdens, but also the possibilities of family in the stories. On. Oh, it is on. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really, really great question. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think you could think about it as, as a kind of navigating the tension between, you know, tradition and modernity that is is present in Call Me Zebra, but I, you know, was also hearing in, in the reading, um, in the way he's reading as well. And, and I think that that's also the tension between community and, and individualism, right? And, and, and also sort of the parameters of intimacy are different depending on whatever cultural uh, lineage you inherit and are functioning in and, um, w you know, what kind of love exists and what are the possibilities for love, whether it's the love of a child toward a parent, which, oh, there we go. Um, so much of it is about loyalty, I think, and the threat of betraying their sacrifices. And I think Zebra feels that really strongly, but because she's so fierce, it's buried in a, in a way. I mean, she's definitely, carrying on the tradition because she feels she's been told she has to and it isolates her for sure but it also allows her to survive in in a way and that's the double-edged sword of of exile to some degree or migration and she's constantly migrating in a way yeah she has she's navigating more than two sets of identities or cultural heritages so her life is constantly interrupted and she's constantly having to reinvent herself so in a way, uh, she sort of has trouble figuring out whether or not she even exists or what reality is because her points of reference are constantly being sort of raised to the ground and then um, she has to figure out how to relate to, to those cultural references, I think, yeah. Uh, so, my, my narrative. Well, she she has some. I mean, she definitely has issues. I can. That's true. Um, but with the idea of you know individual individuality, um, that's a that is a complicated question for her. I think um, like what you said. There's a lot of community. There's a lot of loyalty. Um, there's a lot of um, like owing. I think there's a sense that you owe 
um, those before you and those before you um, and those before them for what they've done. Um, and she has such a hard time coming to terms with um, becoming her own person because of all of that, I guess, burden to prove herself or to prove that her parents made the right choice, that sort of thing. Um, and then Eric, I, you know, when I wrote Eric, I just wrote him as this complete contrast, right? Like they teach you in class to write a foil, right? <laughs> so he's a good foil um, in which he, he is just sort of sprung out of this weird but almost, you know, paradise place. Um, and he's his own person. He has direction. He's sort of everything that is a different American dream, I think. Not the not the American dream that's defined by immigration, but the American dream that's like you kind of pull yourself up by your own straps. Is that yeah, bootstraps? Um, and I think that's 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 his, that's him. So she always feels such pressure to you know be that, but also be the individual that her parents wanted her to be. I mean, her parents want her to be fierce, I think, but. She just has such a hard time getting to that point um, in part of the novel. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is actually both of the characters, in it, the both of the narrators, um, are only children, and um, in Zebra, it's very clear this is the end of the line, um, and it's not so certain um, in chemistry, but it's definitely there's this feeling of like I might I might. That my parents might leave me behind, and I'm the only one. And and actually, what's interesting in chemistry is that, in some ways, it's a minimal family, even though it's an immigrant family. It's um, at some point she talks. Up, the character talks about ha having one cousin, um, or in the U.S. and being very distant from the family in China. Um, and whereas I think in Zebra, it's this. It just takes up the family takes up. I mean, not just the family, all these other writers and thinkers, but takes up so much imaginative space, right? Um, but she's also alone. Um, I wonder too, both of the, um, both of the narrators um, are really interesting because they're not, they're in different ways difficult women, right? Um, I think there's this interesting thing in terms of, um, I mean, I was going to read a tiny, bit from, like, you, you read that part in the beginning where some, she, like, there's this very passive um, aspect of um, the narrator of chemistry, like the, needing the, like, waiting for the toothbrush, right? But that, but there's an aggression in that, right? There's something, there's a, it's a very, it's, it's a very resistant, like, I'm not going to marry you, or I'm going to make, I'm going to make you wait, I'm going to make you do everything kind of energy. And um, Zebra is, at times, like insufferable, um, manic. I mean, there was this moment. It's just amazing. There's a moment where, in Barcelona, a, like an American tourist is just standing there, and then um, the zebra goes up and just starts telling her about like life and death. And do you know that you're the specter of history? You're like, th I mean, that's not exactly what she says, but it's <laughs> it's 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 as bad. <laughs> I mean, in terms of like just um, so it's like unbearable, right? Um, and yet, like, there's this intense energy in these, um, both of these characters. Um, and I'm curious if you could just speak, just as, as writers, what it was like inhabiting these um, women narrators who are um, difficult in, in different ways. I mean, liberating, I think, to some degree. And, you know, I... I think some of the influences that, that led me to her voice that aren't directly in the book are Latin American boom writers like Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude or uh, Juan Rulfo's Pedro Paramo. And that tension in those novels where you can't tell, or the narrators sometimes can't tell what's real, what's not real, what's history, what's mythology, fact, fiction, right? Who's dead, who's alive? Everything's kind of um, superimposed in this really in this way that causes a kind of m magical psychosis, I guess. And I think that when Zebra speaks to people in the way that you were just referring, she's not entirely sure that they're seeing her. She's not entirely convinced that she exists, so it's really hard for her to even be fully accountable for her behavior. And I think that's part of the kind of um, 
the struggle for her into in, in kind of dethawing and coming into herself through this encounter with Ludo. And for me it was it was really liberating to to just let her, you know, take the wheel for a couple of years and she taught me a lot about how to be be, you know, fierce and, and sort of how to talk about these the nuances of what it means to be an immigrant and what it means to be navigating um, that identity, especially as someone from the from Iran or the Middle East, where it's just so strange you're here because you can't be there, and then you know your family's still struggling, and so much gets inherited and lost and passed down, and and at the same time, you know, it, the Middle East is being kind of obliterated in the process, and there's no one really realized. I mean, it's just there, that there's a psychosis in that, right? So she kind of. Um, kept my feet to the fire. Yeah. yeah, and there's a real political charge even in those moments because she, she herself says, I'm, I'm going to take up space. Mm -hmm. And these groups of people who are being marginalized, um, the refugees, the exiles, the people that, in that, even that moment I just described, it's an American tourist who's just kind of doing her American tourist thing. There's nothing, it's, it, it represents, you know, the representation of just, um, like she says, I'm not doing anything. Were you speaking to me? I'm not. I'm just here. I'm just here. Nothing is That's happening. Right. Yeah. And and uh, the narrator says, actually, you just being here. There's a lot loaded into that, right? Um, like this um, this assumption of American innocence um, is being also um, attacked in that moment. That's right. right. Uh, so, the question of what it was like to inhabit the character. <laughs> um, well, you know, in writing first person, I think maybe um, with first person, it, you're very close with the character within first person, and I think sometimes um, in creating a, a narrator like the one in chemistry, you do have to take, you have to kind of pick and choose qualities you want to really exaggerate. Um, so I think in trying to create this character, I was looking around me and also into myself, the most, you know, the characters that make um, people around you or people that you know the most inhuman and then you exaggerate that in a narrator to make it more vibrant, to make the character more believable, funny, endearing, to make the character seem real even though you're exaggerating everything from real life or kind of making it up. Um, so to inhabit that, it felt like, I mean, it's fiction, so it felt like lying. I felt like I was lying most of the time, but it was so, um, like you said, liberating, but also just really enjoyable. Um, you sort of say things that, you know, um, you think maybe some people think, but you're ne never, never really sure, so you kind of put that into the character. Um, it, it's a lot of dreaming, I think, in that re regard for creating a first person. Yeah. I'm curious there about form, because what's interesting is that your um, novel is written in these really short sections. It reminded me a little bit of um, Jenny Ophill's yeah. Department of Speculation. Mm -hmm. This kind of, you get this little mm -hmm. moment of the, the love story or the science lab, mm -hmm. but then you get all these like, wonderful little bits about science. Mm -hmm. And that must have also just been really fun to, to both work in that form right that's not like it's not super like it's not street it's not a stream it's like yeah. these different little parts but you yeah. get to work in the um science and so i'm, I'm yeah. curious for both of you in terms of the like what it was le like your strategies for weaving in the science because you can't just take everything you know and dump it in there you have to make it part of a plot no. and with literature um similarly like there it's it's woven in in these i mean there's obviously a lot of stuff that you haven't quoted that's in the book but just the way that it's woven in so that it, it um, still feels like it's a narrator's voice and it's a, it's a you know, it's a story. I'm just yeah. Well, in, in one point in your novel, you, you quoted Orwell saying, the face that you have at 30 is what you deserve. I really, I highlighted <laughs> that. And I was like, this is true, but scary. <laughs> um, but I thought that came in at a really great moment. Um, but I think weaving in is really difficult. Um, you know, I think, there's no outlining for something like that. You kind of have to feel it, right? You have to feel the right moment, you put it in, and then you rearrange, you put it in, you rearrange. Um, um, I, um, in undergrad, I worked with Amy Hempel for a while, and she just, her only piece of advice was that you just build a story like you build a house, you know, brick by brick, but one sentence at a time. 
which is a very hempel thing to say, I think, at the time. And then now I realize it has a lot of truth that you just look at the previous sentence and you say, well, what makes sense? What would the reader accept as the next progression? You know, what would the smart reader accept? And I think you just sort of work it in that way, little by little. It's a lot of revision, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's right. It's a lot of a lot of drafting, and it's also, I think, important to note that that both the chemistry in your case and literature and in in you know, call me zero's narrator. It's part of the central drama of of their character. It's it's sort of how they're, it's the medium through which they're navigating that original wound, right? So it's not this thing that's an infrastructure coming in from the outside. It's, it's really a part of the fabric of their consciousness, right? And it's part of the legacy of their families. So it's, um, it never to me felt like, how am I going to weave this in? But I think, Sometimes there, I had to scale back, and um, you know, Naomi, my editor, was was really fantastic at at knowing where it was just enough. And in fact, that seems to me the challenge um, is when you know a lot, and you're inhabiting a character who is specialized, mm -hmm. as both of your characters are, um, pulling back enough so that it makes it readerly and mm -hmm. yeah, move along. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to zone in on, on a couple of small details. Um, so in chemistry, um, there's this interesting use of articles, like the best friend, the boyfriend. Um, and it's discussed in terms of the Chinese um, of Mandarin, um, the, like the lack of articles, for instance. It's discussed in a moment. But there's something about um, the articles, for instance, that feels distancing, right? The, the boy, you know, the opening paragraph um, has that distancing quality. And in Zebra, um, there's this, at the beginning, there's something about um, possessives. Um, the father says to the child, child. And the narrator notes, it wasn't my child. And that the father says, doesn't want to use the possessive. And that's also, it's, it's an interesting moment because it's both, there's something distancing in that, like the not claiming, um, the, the child is a vessel for something else. Um, and yet, um, there, these are tensions. There's this, there's this quality of distance in both of the narrators. And I, it seems to me that, that their own um, difficulties with love, for instance, um, and their own um, distancing techniques um, also connect to the experience of migration or loss, cultural loss. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, at any scale, like call, talking about the details of, of, uh, of the novel, but also maybe at, at the larger scale of like the big themes, um, if you could talk about the way in which the characters, like the, w the way that the, those big themes of historical loss or immigration kind of intersect with um, the character's own difficulties with intimacy? Um, sure. So uh, with, with the naming, the, the, the articles, um, I, when I started, I was using it kind of as a placeholder for how I wanted, you know, it's just what sounded right with the voice. Um, when I write, I tend to be more, you know, does this sound right? Does this not sound right? And I just couldn't think of a name at the moment. Um, and I started writing more. The articles just kept being the best friend. Um, Eric is the only person who's named because I didn't know if he was the boyfriend or the fiance or, you know, the ex-boyfriend, ex-fiance, I guess. That would be weirder. Um, and I guess I wanted to, and the dog, um, and for her, it's like the compartmentalization of her life that she only has, you know, she has one dog and then she has, you know, one best friend because that's what best means. You can't have more than one, hopefully. <laughs> um, you know, the lab mate because um, she sits next to her and it's like a proximity effect, right? It's like how she organizes her life. Um, and it, it, I realized it kind of made sense with how she thought as a person. Um, 
And I think in the idea of immigration, you know, she, um, in immigrating, you do, you cut ties. I mean, you you don't necessarily, you know, there's, thank God for Skype and like video chat and all of those things. But I think when I, when I left, there was, you know, for 15 years, I didn't see my grandparents. And it was just this huge wash of time that you just don't see anyone that you're related to and you just see this nuclear family. So you're the daughter and then this is the mom and this is the dad. And I think that's how you kind of orient your life in this very small nuclear pocket. Um, you know, there's no such thing as second cousin twice removed who comes to your reunion because you don't have reunions. So um, I think the way she thinks about her life is trying to pack it together into this very, very tight ball um, because she grew up in such a very small, um, small community, I guess, in that way. Yeah, that, that's interesting about Skype. I think I, I recently saw my second cousin on Skype, but we hadn't seen each other in 15 years. And it was a really, really uncanny experience to just that it was both really familiar and very strange. Um, but I hadn't really thought about why it had sort of disturbed me so much. The The question about history and how that affects intimacy and, you know, for, for, in, for Zebra, I think she's in preservation mode a lot of the time. And she's been, um, you know, it's both in Iran and abroad, sort of people have imposed narratives on her. And she is really sensitive to being claimed by anybody, right? Um, so part of her tension with Ludo is that in some ways, you know, even when they first meet, he has this state, this poster that's, you know, saying here to reclaim blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, I mean, you, she, and she goes on and on about being claimed and you, you can't reclaim something you haven't claimed before and she's really obsessed with it and he doesn't understand what she's getting at and and I don't think she does either to some degree but it's this discomfort with with possessing anything being possessed by anyone because then the there is the possibility of invasion and encroachment on the one hand and the deep fear of loss on the other um I'm going to ask one more question before we turn it over to the audience, but I'm mentioning this now so that you can prepare your questions. So um, if anyone has questions, just um, think them up, cook them up. And um, I guess the last question I'll ask is um, what I found interesting, again, there were these odd little minor um, moments of connection in these very different kinds of books, but um, both had to do with going off the straight path. Um, I know in chemistry it was mentioned in terms of uh, this, there's this actually a moment where limbo is mentioned. Um, and it's more directly mentioned in Call Me Zebra um, because there is this invocation of Dante and you know, going off the straight path. Um, and um, for the narrator of chemistry, it's going off this track of achievement um, and you know, career and in Kami Zebra, it's, um, it's this excavation of, I mean, the narrator goes on this grand tour of exile and goes on architectural walks of fragmentation. And it's just really, um, it's, it's um, so circuitous, the path, but it's a retracing and it's, and it's very much concerned with um, the past also. So it's, not, it's like, it's an anti-progressive narrative. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about just what that aspect, of, like the ex um, experience of um, the characters in terms of their paths, in terms of time, the journeys. I think Zebra's family is pretty eccentric. I don't. I, I guess it would. She doesn't deviate from their eccentricity as much as she comes from a family of eccentrics who couldn't probably even figure out how to operate within uh, within Iran, right? And and that it's also an interesting question about the diaspora, exile, the different kinds of exile and migration, who leaves, who chooses to stay, and then within families, people make different choices as well that cause tensions for generations that, you know, are are really fascinating. And she's a, she calls herself a flanora of death, and she's sort of 
you know, really, I think, married to her state as as a wanderer, and there is no room in that relationship for a Ludo Bambo <laughs> or anybody else, really, except the bird. Um, and, I mean, that changes. She's not a static character, so that definitely changes over the course of the novel. And she realizes that, that you know, the, that it this this it's not the straight path versus the crooked path. It's not this kind of binary option, right? And I think that's part of the coming of age story, that realization of coming into ambiguity and allowing this huge gray area to exist and and to play in that. And in her family, actually, it was never. I mean, there was exile within Iran, right? Before, right, and right. And it was like a history of them always, the family always being cast mm -hmm. out and killed and so on. Right, right. And the only sort of antidote to that would have been her mother, but she she dies so early on, and, and part of the regression is a recovery of, of, I think, a sort of openness to vulnerability to some degree and, and a, you know, yeah, having one foot in life and one foot in literature. No, I think you said it really well, the gray area. That's a lot of growing up. Um, I think this narrator, when I was writing her, you know, if I had to think about it, she sort of morphed into this person that if I had to ask myself in high school, I probably would have hated, like this, this person who had no idea what she was doing in life. And then writing about this kind of character is just part of adulthood I think you you sort of embrace that you don't know a lot of things and she doesn't know um, she doesn't have a very stable personal life um, she doesn't finish something that was very very important to her um, and but she's she seems actually pretty stable by the end she has a good community around her um, and she's kind of weighing out what's important what's not important or what can be important later on um, and I think writing, yeah, like you said, it's a coming of age novel. Um, you know, her following a crooked path is um, crooked, also based on her, you know, parents' expectations. That's one aspect. But going into science is very straight. I mean, you you get a science major, you get a grad school, you have to get a postdoc, you have to get a second postdoc if you're in biology, um, and then you have to get a job. I mean, it's it's just bam, bam, bam. You go one step at a time, and that kind of straightness is. Um, it's a race, so she just feels like she just needed to take herself out of the race a little bit, and then maybe she'll go back in, but it wasn't even a path, I think, at a point where she started to break down. She just realized that it was just something that she couldn't keep up with at that time. Questions from the audience? I mean, I think one of the, huh? okay. um, there's a moment in the book where you're talk uh, you, uh, okay. <laughs> where you're using I think that as a hispanist I see all of the uh, there's first of all there's international sedimentation I mean there are so many literatures informing the character that it's impossible to to really do the compendium, it's encyclopedic. Um, but there is a very strong presence of, of Spanish and Latin American literature and of the, the idea of the Quixote on the one hand and then all of the Catalan references on the other hand that seem to be a parallel for her in, and also for her father's character. And I just wonder if you'd like to talk about both, either of, or both of those. Yeah, so she she's really interested in 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 what it means to be a, a person in the world, right? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to to be alive? And um, and I think that she she goes to these big journey narratives like Don Quixote to kind of try to figure out that gap between reality and perception, but also is so in love with how funny he is and how strange he is and how authentic and committed to his own vision of the world he is as a character, right? And he's really transgressive, so I think that appeals to, to me and to Zebra quite a bit. 
And then the, the Catalan thread is also this kind of comes from my, my understanding of the world having grown up in all these different places and, and often in pretty remote areas of, of Spain or Iran. And, and this sort of deep relationship to the landscape and to regionalism and the tension between the regional and the global. And uh, reading Catalan literature, which um, is so engaged with the landscape, with historical memory, with oppression, and so many of the writers that I was reading uh, were writers of exile who had to go to France uh, or, or, or to Argentina, right? Um, it sort of gave me a different perspective on what, what is that kind of a journey versus a, a journey that's an adventure, that's play, that's a kind of total commitment to your imagination. I mean, there's intersections between those, but, but they're also vastly different. So I wanted to find a space where I was threading those together. And I love Catalan literature. I think it's just phenomenal uh, work and a language that's wonderful to read and translation for, for English speakers because it's, it has a kind of reverberation that I think um, can can really resonate with English speakers. So, yeah. Hi. Um, so this. So I'm a medical student, and I studied creative writing. So I think in terms of like thinking about chemistry and like how you're sort of weaving together like science and literature. Um, well, you talked about it a little bit earlier, but as a writer, I was just wondering like how you sort of like went through that process. Cause to me often they seem like very different worlds and like people from each world are like not always willing to talk to each other. And so having that sort of like either as a writer or in thinking about a reader, like how you sort of manage that, like the tension between those two worlds and how you're kind of weaving them together. Huh, that's a good question. They don't talk to each other. I mean, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, they, I think um, basic science, at least, doesn't really talk to literature in a very similar way. But, um, you know, one aspect that to deal with that, you, you do have to choose, right, to go down whether you're going to go writing professionally or whether you're going to be a doctor professionally. That That is a choice. Um, but... I think a lot of the science is sort of picking up the thing that in creative writing you're telling a narrative. So to write a paper, your PI is always saying write a story, even though it, it doesn't quite reply because you have abstract methods, you know, supplementary index. <laughs> um, and but in medicine too, there you're encouraged to tell your story, right, in your personal sta statement for your residency, for your fellowship. Um, <clears throat> so I think they're really embracing the idea of narrative, which I, I'm really happy about, that the, uh, the, um, in conveying information, <clears throat> the best way to convey an information to a readership is through a story um, and not through just a list of facts or a list of accomplishments or a list of numbers. Um, and I do find that the two fields kind of interact in that way that to have good, you know, storytelling skills is really great for narrative medicine, really good for selling your science or telling your science. Um, and that's actually what gets people motivated into those fields. So honestly, the more of that intersection is, um, that, that would be a joy for me. But, you know, it is hard, I think, to find that overlap. Hi. Um, I'm curious whether uh, either or both of you set out to write funny novels. Um, I know having read some of Call Me Zebra and your other work, Azarine, there's, um, there are several points where you feel like laughing, but like you could be scolded for laughing. Um, <laughs> Like when Zebra says she's writing a manifesto when, her, when the police come and her dad has just died. It feels like a very painful kind of humor. And, and for both of you, I wonder, uh, my question is how, how conscious was working humor into the writing and, um, and how much was it just emergent from the story? I don't know. I, 
I wish I could answer that in an exact way, but I, you know, I, I love I love to laugh, and that that's a sort of a th a thing that I experience as as you know something that's communal and brings people together, and is kind of the one of the resources I've had in the face of really absurd events, and it's also free, you know. Like I've been really aware of that lately, like you know. Laughter is just free, you know, you can you don't need anything to do it. You just need another person or sometimes you can just be inside your mind and and if, You know, I, I laugh alone a lot and I, I and zebra made me laugh so much and she also made me weep a lot I mean, I think what you're saying is true and um, And sometimes it's like both together, right? It's that intimate place where the laughter turns into into weeping or vice versa and that's just the nature of her life. It's also the nature of the absurdity of becoming dispossessed entirely and then not being sure if what you saw before was a dream or what you're seeing now is a dream. I mean, there are aspects of your life and identity that will never be reconciled as, as someone who's an outsider. And that gap is absurd. And I don't know, if you don't laugh about it, what else are you going to do? <laughs> so... Um, and, and just humor is important to me in, in, in the work that I love to read. It's both deadly serious and really, really funny at the same time. And, and I think that's part of the, the sort of bond with readers and the kind of gift that I like to leave, you know? Uh, I, I think it, it, you don't, it, with humor, it's, humor is, I think it's it's very easy to be humorous in person, but in writing, it's honestly the hardest thing, I find. Um, if you intend to do it, it comes off as very stiff. Um, it almost has to be very natural um, because timing is everything for humor. Um, so when I started writing, I, I, I don't think I intended it to be funny. Um, it's just the sentiment of, it's just the way I sort of write, I guess. Um, you know, I think I couldn't write ever, even in the third person, a, f a very serious novel um, without any humor. You need levity without, you know, without darkness. Without lightness, there isn't darkness. Um, so I would, I, for, for, I guess, aspiring writers, I always say don't, don't say no to humor. Um, always try to, you know, bring it into the, bring it into the story. Um, but it has to happen naturally. But don't think too much about it. It's like a lot of, yeah, yeah, do's and don'ts, right? <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. One more. I have a question, and I don't know if this was your choice, but about the discussion's name, like Nerds in Love. I was just curious about what that meant to you and what kind of nerd you were referring to? Nerd, yeah. I mean, I, I think both our narrators have this very um, interesting mind. This is the way that they think. You know, Zebra has this highly intellectual mind that, you know, goes off into, you know, philosophy, complet, and it's just this encyclopedia. Um, and my narrator, you know, goes into science a little bit more. Um, and I guess the idea of nerds to me is, you know, for, for one, it, it's, um, it's like we're taking it back, right? Nerds are taking that word back. Uh, but I do think it's just somebody who went to school, paid attention in class, got a good education. <laughs> education is so highly overrated now, and I, I think that's a shame because I love reading very smart narrators, and I love reading mer very smart narrators written by very smart writers. Um, you know, you're reading for the mind, and I, I, I think that's a, that's a, that to me is what, you know, nerds in love would mean. I, I echo that. I, I don't think we chose, the, you know, the, the title for, for the talk, but I, you know, I think it speaks to, yeah, both the, the sort of intellectual uh, nature of the narrators and also the sort of in both cases, pretty absurd love affairs or lack thereof that they're that they're in. Yeah. Great. Um, on that note, um, thank you both um, for the wonderful 
evening of conversation, and thank you all for being here. We have books in the back, and I hope that um, if you buy a book, you can get it signed. Um, so please um, stick around for a few minutes, and we'll, we can mingle and buy books and sign them and um, be on our way. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.